right? Have a seat? Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> Postgres, of course, implements SQL. It's kind of in the name, right? And, and as uh, was just said, I've been involved in Postgres development for you know, quite some time now. And for the longest time, this SQL that we're supposed to implement just kind of appeared out of somewhere, right? And every couple of years, like, oh, there's a new SQL standard. Okay, well, we got to look through, you know, what's what's happening, and then we got to sort of implement that and, and catch up, right? So that that's sort of the, been the experience for for the longest time for me and, and other community members. And a few years ago, I managed to get involved and, and figure out where the actual SQL standard actually is developed and get got involved in this process. And then uh, since that also other community members have gotten involved as well. And so I want to just, you know, share that with you of how that actually works and, you know, how that uh, affects Postgres uh, development. So you, the way I think about this, usually at a conference like this, there's a talk, there's actually multiple at this event of how to become a Postgres developer, something like that, right? Or how to make, I think, how to write a patch or something like that, right? So in some way, this is the same, but for SQL, right? How do, how does it work? How can you contribute? How, how, how can you be involved? So I'm not necessarily meaning, right? Simon basically just said, like, everybody should get involved in Postgres contribution. I'm not necessarily saying everybody should get involved in contributing to this. Maybe we, we'll talk about this at the end. Maybe a couple more uh, heads would be uh, okay, but mostly I just want to tell you so you can understand how this happens and how this affects Postgres, right? So I was already introduced. Um, so it is uh, 2023 now, so I, I, I suppose I've been involved in SQL Working Group for four years now. So it, of course, time was a blur over some of those years, so. All right. So the first thing to figure out is like, where does this actually happen? Like, who who does that, right? You, you, some of you you will heard of ISO and and you know ANSI and then some of these terms in this context. So this is the sort of hierarchy of where this actually happens. Where does the work actually happen? And so you know you've heard of ISO, right? It's an, standardization organization. There's another standardization organization which is independent of ISO called IEC. International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, so they're separate, and, and they work on you know standardization across all kinds of fields. ISO, of course, is well known. They do all kinds of things, starting from like paper sizes to machine parts, business processes, all kinds of stuff. Right? You've heard of that. IEC does, of course, sort of more electrical things, like you know the plugs and stuff like that, and then you know so sort of how electricity works and that kind of stuff. And Somehow they decided when this computer stuff appeared some time ago, you know, that there's sort of overlapping jurisdiction, I suppose, and, and they figured that they, they will collaborate on everything having to do with information technology. So this uh, JTC, it's called JTC, is the Joint Technical Committee uh, was uh, created. So everything, just about everything that you think of in, in, in the world of computer, standardization that you think of ISO probably actually goes to JTC1. Things like programming languages, right? There's an ISO standard for C, C++. There's, you know, sort of graphics format, JPEG, uh, PNG. There's ISO standards for that. All of this goes to JTC1. And then below that, there's, you know, another level of hierarchy. There's a SC, a subcommittee. There's different subcommittees for different areas of information technology, for example, SC22 is programming languages, and so that's where you'll find you know, the C, C++ people meeting. And what's for us is SC32, which is data management and interchange, and then within that, there's a couple different working groups. That's WG, that's the working group. And what's relevant for us is working group three, that's where database languages are being discussed and standardized, right? So that's where, you know, in the sort of the bureaucratic hierarchy of these organizations, that's where it actually happens. So. so one thing I've wondered also while I was sort of digging into this some time ago, uh, you know, what, what do these different levels actually mean? Do I need to know all about all this? Pretty much no. If you want to just 
you know, contribute to SQL. It's really the working group that does the work. The levels above that are more like administration and, and you know, project, project management, as I say here, where sort of, you know, for example, all of the ISO standards have common style guidelines, right? If you, if you pull up the SQL standard and if you pull up the C++ standard next to each other, you will notice they kind of work the same way, have the same hierarchies, you know, section numbers and stuff like that. So, that, you know, there's stuff like that being decided. But in reality, you don't really need to worry about that too much because basically only the, the working group level is where the actual work happens. All right, so now if you found that working group, and you say, I want to join that, you can't actually go to ISO as an individual and say, I want to you know, join and uh, you know, participate in whatever it is. The, the members of ISO are the so-called national bodies. There's one in, well, probably just about every country. And, and you will recognize some of those uh, acronyms here and you know, depending on what country you're from. So in every country, there's a, a main standardization body and there are usually members of ISO, and so if you wanted to join all of this, and this applies to SQL, this applies to if you want to work on any other thing that ISO does, you first go to your national body and contact them and say, you know, I want to participate, and then they, they have their own way of doing that somehow, right? So I'm from Germany, so I went to Dean, wrote them an email, said I want to participate in this, they sent me a couple of emails back. You know, I had to fill out a form. Part of the reason of you know, this sort of bureaucracy is ISO and IEC, they're very picky about intellectual property rights. So that you, know, you fill out paperwork that says, you know, I relinquish all the property rights, I promise I don't have any patents on this, that kind of stuff. I should probably actually know what it says in there. I don't remember what it says in there, but it's not that important really for the work I'm doing, but you can imagine if you're working on sort of graphics format or video encoding formats, that's a huge issue there, right? So that's why you can't just sort of show up anonymously and say, yeah, I have a good idea. So everything has to be, you know, there has to be paperwork and paper trails for everything, right? So uh, one of the problems is that not all national bodies actually participate in, well, these levels, right? So not all national bodies are participating in SC32, not all national bodies are participating in JTC1, just because they don't care, they want to, they don't care to pay the money, I don't know. So if you are living in a country where your national body is not participating, for example, this would apply to the, the Czech national body as far as I know. That's kind of a problem, there's not really a good solution. In some cases, you can also go to a different national body if your employer is located in that country. Right? A lot of participants in WG3 are living in various countries, but they're actually joining through ANSI because that's where their employer is. So that also works. It's a bit of an unfortunate situation, but there, there might be workarounds available. All right, so each of these national bodies have their own structure that kind of looks like that, but it's still their own internal structure like that. So in my case, again, I'm you know, in the uh, German uh, national body and they have their own, these like acronyms and numbers and stuff like that that you have to kind of maneuver and, and that they sort of mirror the international structure. So I, I went to them and say, I want to join this body you know, the NA, whatever, right? And then once I joined that, they then sort of delegated me then to the international body. This is all basically just on paper. It doesn't actually meet, there's no meetings of that, right? I don't actually go there, but sort of formally, that's kind of the way the structure is built, right? And then, you know, in the US, there's this also, they even have a website and, 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 and then the other national bodies have, have their own so local structures that mirror the international structures. So really to summarize, like how do you get, if you want to sign up for this, how do you do it? You find your national body. If that national body is already involved in JTC1, SC32, okay, you can just, you know, send them an email probably. They'll send you some paperwork to fill out. You pay a fee and then you're good. If not, okay, then as I just mentioned, you kind of have to find a workaround. It's a bit of a case-by-case -case situation, but in principle, this is how it works. 
And for me, this was, you know, I did this, as I mentioned, in, in 2019 or so. This took like a month, basically, just to send some, you know, forms back and forth. It was, once you find them, it's not really a, a like, big problem. Okay, so there's also, you can also, as I mentioned, these upper levels, they also exist, they also do things. If you happen to be the only person in your country who is involved in WG3, then you're like, so by default, I guess, also the head of your country's delegation in SD32, and then you can also go to those meetings. But I, I don't do that, but that, that's sort of, you know, basically on SD32 levels, it goes by country, basically, and so every country's group basically nominates one person as their voting representatives on that level, and so you could also do that. Right. So this is important to, I just kind of alluded to that, on the sort of these higher levels of committees, the, the you know, voting and stuff like that happens by national body, mainly basically by country, right? But again, this is bureaucracy. Uh, but on the working group level, the participation is what they call individual expert. And so that means if I'm showing up there, it's just me and my expertise, right? I'm not representing, you know, EDB or Postgres or Germany or some anyone, right? I'm there with me and my expertise, and I can do whatever I want. Obviously, my expertise is derived from, you know, my you know, background and employers and stuff like that, but the people who are in the room, they are just themselves with their knowledge and opinions, right? So here is, uh, if you're kind of interested, maybe this is sort of the, 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 the slide to, to photograph. There's a couple of people that, if you want to get in touch with this somehow, you know, obviously you can contact me afterwards, maybe if you want, but Keith Hare is the convener, is basically the chairperson of WG3, so if you, know, you want to get involved, you can email him. He's quite happy to you know, get in, in touch with people and, and, and explain what you, what's going on. And then there's also a, a committee manager it's sort of a dual structure, basically. Keith is a member of the group, so he participates in it. But the committee manager is kind of provided by ISO, or ANSI in this case, and they run sort of the bureaucracy in the background. But he's also someone to contact if you just want to know, I, hey, I'm from country X. Who is my local national body? I don't know. They could find that out for you. Right? So either of these people are in my experience, quite happy to sort of answer questions if you just want to find something. All right, so now let's say you got it, you found, you found the, the working group you, to do some actual work, uh, you got to go to a meeting. That's where that, all that work happens. Right? So it's not really sort of mailing list. There is a mailing list, but it's not really mailing list culture, maybe that in the way we're used to, or you know, other standardization bodies like IETF and stuff, they do everything by mailing list. This ISO is very much meetings. You have a meeting, you discuss, meeting ends, see you in three months for the next meeting. That's sort of the notional structure, right? So in the four times, as we call them now, typically it was two to three meetings a year, Usually February, June, September, is typically, and you know, one week each, you meet in a place, in a conference room, for you know the whole week, basically all all day, and then you just work through your agenda. Um, the way this works is usually the June meeting is also the SC32 meeting, so that's sort of once a year, and then the other meetings are just WG3 meetings, and then of course, as we all. We can talk about the past now. This is um, uh, between 2020 and 22. Of course, there uh, was issues holding in-person meetings, and this affected the ISO procedures just as much as everybody else. You know, what do we do now? And then it was sort of everybody had to scramble and figure out, like, okay, we'll have Zoom meetings, right? That's basically what ended up happening. So my Work was basically, you know, work Zoom meetings, and then, okay, ISO Zoom meetings, the same thing, basically. I right? just dial into a different conference. But you had to kind of figure out, like, well, you can't have a Zoom meeting for a whole week, right? So you had to figure out some kind of different cadence of this, and we played around with different, you know, sort of variations. What we ended up doing at the end was usually 
well, we had monthly meetings basically for, for a while of, sort of three hours every day for three days. So typically maybe Monday, Wednesday, Thursday for three hours each. You know, so that would be then the nine hours it says there. And so if you kind of all add that up, it kind of ends up being the same amount of work. Um, but we also had, you know, and then you have to, if you're at the meeting, you're at that location in that time zone, right? But if you're having virtual meetings, like what time zone are they in? And so we kind of rotated that around a little bit so that every next meeting is sort of offset by a few hours. And we experimented with different variations of that. I remember one time we had a, I, we had a meeting that for me was at 3 a.m. in the morning. So that was a bit of a tough one. Yeah. And then, of course, now uh, uh, this is sort of a thing in the past for the most part. Uh, we're back to in-person meetings now, but also a mix of uh, uh, sort of occasional virtual meetings, sort of a, as the need arises. I guess we're still figuring that out, but we're basically back to t three in-person meetings a year and then virtual meetings in between them uh, as, as the necessity arises. So this is the, just so you have an idea, uh, as an example, the, the meeting schedule of the sort of the current cycle, so to speak. As I mentioned, in June is usually the SV32 meeting, and then you have other meetings in between. Um, so in earlier this year, we had a meeting in Washington, D.C. Um, the most recent in-person meeting was in Casablanca in September. And then we had two virtual meetings in October, November, just a few weeks ago, and then the next ones are, the next one is planned in Barbados in March, and then the other ones after that are still a little bit uh, being finalized, is, is my understanding at the moment. So, And uh, a particularity of WG3 meetings is the, the meetings are internally named after the airport code, so these are the, these, uh, what I have in parentheses here, right? DCA is the airport code in, is an airport in Washington, for example. That's sort of the, an internal notion, so that you can then years back, years later, you can say, "Oh, at the DCA meeting, we discussed this and that, right?" Or at the whatever so and so meeting. One side effect of that is uh, intentional side effect is that you shouldn't go back to the same place more than once. Um, or in you know certain cases, if it's a big city, you can go two or three times, depending on how many airports you find. All right. All right. All right. So you can see how this works. Uh, th this is a picture. You know, so it's not you know, very fancy. It's a conference room. So this was a meeting in Berlin uh, in June 2020, uh, 2022. This was held at the headquarters of Dean in Berlin. And you know, so it's a conference room with people with laptops, and you talk about things. So you can see me back here. <laughs> and the way this works is the the person who took the photo was you know sort of standing here, and it's kind of like that. There's a screen, not quite the room is not quite as big, but there's a screen in front, and somebody's presenting, you know, with from their laptop and say, "Here's my proposal," and then people look at it or look at their laptops, or you know, so. All right, here's another meeting that this was in, in, North, North, in North Macedonia in September 2022, a little bit smaller group. This was in a hotel. Um, this was in the Netherlands earlier this year. This was interesting when I updated these slides here. Um, this, this feels like such a long time ago, but it was only earlier this year. And you will also see another, besides me, you'll also see another uh, face who is also in this room. You maybe figure that out. <laughs> and uh, let's see, we'll go one more here. Okay, this was the Washington DC meeting. So, you know, you see those all the same group of faces. And, you know, it's usually 10, 15 people or so, so it's not like a huge group, right? I read the other day, I think the C group is over 100 people. So, this is definitely not that big. Yeah. And this is the most recent meet in, in person meeting, as I mentioned, in, in Casablanca in Morocco. So, you know, pretty, this is what you do all day. And then if you're still up for that, of course, in the evening, you can go out for dinner and have sort of informal chats. Okay. 
So each working group in general, ISO, but also the one we're talking about, has different what's called projects. That's basically you're working on a document. Right? So the most well-known amongst those is 9075, that's SQL. But there's also a few other things going on in parallel to that. The one that maybe is most interesting to, to this audience here is 19075. Those are guidance standards, so they're essentially shorter, more readable documents that explain SQL. So you still have to get them from ISO and pay for it, but they're not standards that are very technical and dry, right? They're actually meant to be read as a tutorial explanation. So they might be actually, I've ever run across those, they might actually be kind of interesting to read. And then, well, 29075 is currently not used, but there's a sort of an ongoing proposal to develop a, a new standard for function libraries, like for statistics and things like that. That would then somehow plug into SQL you know, sort of analytics and statistics functions and things like that. It's kind of just kind of being thought about at the moment. 39075 is a new standard that's almost finished. It's a new database language, GQL. It's for graph databases. And then 49075 would be the equivalent of 19075 for GQL. That's uh, not there yet, but it'll probably come soon. Okay. So this... All of these are being worked on in parallel, sort of in diff on different schedules and timelines, but the, the working group is, is not only just working on SQL, okay. So this, uh, just for context, this uh, you know, SQL itself is also a bunch of different documents. It's not only one, you probably, if you're interested in this, you've probably seen this. This is also explained in the Postgres documentation. So there's, um, well, not, not all the numbers are used here. There's 11 parts altogether right now. Part two is the one that most people think about the, of the actual SQL. And then there's a bunch of other stuff for like part three, for example, is kind of like ODBC and of course MED, you know, it's foreign data wrappers and that kind of stuff is part nine, for example, and things like that. There's a bunch of things going on. And then also, this is what I mentioned, 19075, these are these documents. Um, so you can see, for example, if you're interested in row pattern recognition, Postgres doesn't support that yet, but there's a patch out there, you know, we'll, we'll see what comes to that. But if you're actually interested in learning what is row pattern recognition, you can read 19075 part five, and that actually explains it in, you know, it's meant to be read and understood by someone who wants to learn about it. And there's a few mostly for more recent features, right? If you look at sort of parts five, six, seven, eight, these are all relatively recent features. So some some of those, some of them, or like part two, for example, is older. But uh, so again, those are out there if you want, if you're interested in that. Okay, so that's you know, so we found out where the work actually happens. We found out where the meeting is. Maybe we go to a meeting. And so what I forgot to mention is so basically when you are part of the working group, what you really get nowadays is a login to a content management system. And then, then you go in there and then it shows you a list of meetings and then you register for the meeting and say, I want to show up. It's kind of how you go to this conference basically, right? You sort of sign up. <laughs> how, now if you want to, obviously the way you would ideally do this First you show up and you listen a little bit, right? You lurk a little bit. Same as in Postgres, right? You first have to find out where does this actually happen. And then you have to sign up somehow. And then you read along a little bit, ideally. And then maybe at some point you say, I want to make a change, I want to write a patch, right? So this is in some way the same process here. Except we're not making a patch of code, we're making a change proposal to a document. So it, the mechanics are a little bit different, but the process is really the same. All right, so first, well, first you have to come up with an idea. Then you write a change proposal, so I'll show an example of that, but you we'll call it a paper. You know, you write a document, say, I want to change this. You upload it to that content management system I explained, and then you would go to a meeting, and you know, there will be other people presenting, and then they'll 
call you, and then you, it's your turn, and you, I don't know, you don't stand up, actually, you can just keep, sit, <laughs> you keep seated and talk about it, right? But it's on the big screen then, and, and then there's discussion, as you would expect, right? People say, well, what about this, what about that, and can we do this, can we do that, and then maybe you're done at that point, either your paper gets accepted and you're done, or oftentimes there's discussions, maybe you make a second version, Maybe you make a second version and you just kind of present it the next day, or if it's a larger change, you come back to the, at the next meeting, maybe you do it a few times, or maybe at some point you also give up, or you know, it, it's the same possible sort of flow chart, right? And then if it gets accepted, then you're done, then the, the actual, you know, what we would maybe in Postgres call the actual committing is done by the editors. So each working group has you know, one or more editors that are responsible for then actually taking the changes and actually putting into the documents, right? You're not actually writing a patch against XML or anything like that. You're just giving a sort of a explanation of what you want to change and the editors kind of type it in. It's a bit archaic, you could say, but it, it, you know, it's a, you're working on documents, so you know, it doesn't necessarily make, make sense to write patches or something like that. But in any case, that's the process, okay. So here I have a couple of examples, just so you can kind of see how that works. Over here, good. So this is probably the smallest possible paper you could write. Um, this is a paper I wrote, let's make it a little smaller. I can, in, well, 21, 21 it says here, and the, the purpose of this paper is to add a new aggregate function to SQL, which is called any value. This is something that's actually now in Postgres 16, so some of you might have seen that. And this is the paper that did that, right? So it's kind of how you would do a patch submission. First, you explain what you want to do, give some background of, you know, I looked into various ways of solving this, I decided I wouldn't solve it this way. Here's some trade offs I considered maybe and then you give the actual patch, you know, kind of like that, right? So this is kind of the same. I wrote an introduction here, and then I wrote the actual change mechanics here. So I'm saying, okay, here you add a clause. This is the red stuff, right? Here you add a clause, add a new reserved word, add a couple syntax rules, add a thing in, you know, if you've ever seen the SQL standard, you recognize some of these things, that, you know, you put a thing in the BNF, add a couple things into the appendix, uh, the annexes, and then that's it, right? And so the introduction here, this is a bit of a special case, and I'll go into this a bit more in a minute. Um, there, there is, um, at certain stages in the process, you have a, sort of a consult, like a, a, it's called a committee draft consultation, where you send it out and people can comment, so the wider public can comment outside of your working group. And then you get a bunch of comments back that says, you know, you should really do this and this is wrong. And then you have to work through all of this. And what I did in this paper is basically picked up one of those comments and said, yeah, okay, we'll just do that. So my introduction here is basically relatively short because the, the comment that was submitted already explained why we would want to have that. And then I just said like, okay, sure, we'll, we'll do that. It's basically something like you're taking something off the Postgres to-do list. It's a really bad analogy, but just for your explanation, you're taking something off the to-do list and say, I'm going to implement this. And so the, this, the, the, sort of the initial discussion already happened, and I'm just following up on that. And then, so the, the introduction here is relatively short. Now this, the, the, the purpose of the any value aggregate is to return any value. So the actual, implementation of this is very small because the actual implementation is this. Right, it says, you know, if you if you call any value, then you can return an implementation dependent value. That's it. Right? This is the, probably the most simple thing you can do. Obviously, if you write something else, you might have to do pages and pages of the actual d description of what it's supposed to do. Right? Okay, so as I mentioned, this was uh, accepted at the time. It, this is now in SQL, and this is um, in Postgres 16. Here's another more recent paper. This is from Vic, who's also here in this room. This was discussed at the uh, Casablanca meeting. 
And as you can see here, this is R3, so this means it's the third revision, or actually the fourth one, because it starts at zero. But so this went you know, back and forth a few times. And this is a bit longer, but what this does is adds a new um, sort of uh, subclause to the cast specification so you can catch errors. So here's a, what's the actual syntax? Something like that. Yeah, there's, there's lots more, so. So there's a castable predicate, right, that also went in, right? And then you can catch errors. So you have cast, cast this as that, and then on conversion error do something else. So this is something, well, this is this change proposal is relatively new, obviously. We haven't really, we haven't implemented this in Postgres yet, but for those of you who followed that, this is a discussion we've been having over the last few years to be able to catch errors on, on type conversions and things like that. So, yeah, somebody. Vic, are you working on this, or should we get someone else to work on that? Are you working on this, or should we get someone else working on this? Who? Okay, somebody's working on that. Corey, yes, of course. Cool. So, you know, these are just two examples, just so you can kind of see what how this looks. All right. Back to the presentation. And so, as I mentioned, both of these were accepted. The first one is from a few years ago, so this was actually part of a release now. The other one is currently just in the main line, you could say, in the, in the draft main line, and then presumably will then be published in the next uh, version. Uh, and so how does this happen? Just like in software, you have a release sort of cadence of, you know, you do some work, and then you have pre-releases, betas, release candidates, the, the usual things. There's the same idea here except the acronyms are different. So you start with NWIP's new work item proposal, that's where you start, you basically just make a proposal, I wanna work on a new thing. So this was done years ago, so we're not doing that again, right? And then the running state is WD working draft, so that's what's always sort of out there, but it's an unofficial document, that's just what the working group is doing at the time. And then when you think, okay, we got a good state now, let's sort of give it a, pre-publishing, this is a CD, a committee draft, where you basically just send it out to people outside of your working group and say, hey, what do you think? And then you get these comments back of saying, hey, we really should do more of this, we should do, this could be from here's a typo to you guys really should do more blockchain or you know <laughs> stuff like that. This could, and, and you, I mean, in, in the, experience I was in, you might get like a few hundred comments usually from these kind of things. And you know, some of those are you know, typos and stuff like that, that's usually just done by the editors. Some of those more outlandish things, if somebody says you really should do that, then you can just say, okay, thank you for your comment, but we're not doing that right now. But then you could also pick those up, but like for example, the one with the any value, it's just like, okay, we'll write a paper to do that, okay. And so you can do CD consultations a few times, usually once is okay, but you could do that in theory multiple times. And then when you, when you are done, you publish what's a DIS, it's a draft international standard, so that's kind of a beta or release candidate, after which there shouldn't be any more technical changes. You can get comments back from that. Those are usually hopefully more of just typo stuff. If you need to do more changes after the DIS, that kind of means you have messed up a little bit, then you can do another round, FDIS, Final Draft International Standard. And then hopefully when you've done all that, uh, you, you can publish it, International Standard IS. And then there's different voting happens, right? There's, on the CD, there's a, S, only the subcommittee votes, and then for the DIS, the whole JTC1 votes. I mean, this is, doesn't really affect you in practice, but the publication scope gets uh, wider. All right. So this is the current status of 9075, which is SQL. If you just want to skip to the end, basically it was published in June this year, so there's a new SQL 2023 out now. And this is sort of the, the progression that we had. So in the Berlin meeting I showed earlier, we finished the CD comment resolution. That was actually a two week meeting because there was a lot of stuff to work through. And then there was the DIS ballot period. 
sometime late, uh, late uh, in the second half of last year. That was approved. Then at, in, the needing, in the Netherlands that I showed, we finished the DIS comment resolution. So basically fixed all the typos and sort of small, small inconsistencies. And then that was sent for publication and then it was published. So that's out now. So this is maybe of less interest uh, to this particular group, but just so you can see this, how this would sort of work in parallel on a different project. The GQL project is, is, is sort of on a later timeline because it was started at a different time, so that just happens. Uh, that was, they had, uh, at the Netherlands meeting, we did the CD comment resolution. And then there was the DIS ballot period. And now at the, uh, just the meeting that uh, in, in November, we finished the DIS comment resolution. And for GQL, there's going to be an FDIS because the reason for that is that after DIS technical changes were made, so it needs another round of voting, basically. That's happening right now. And then presumably at the next meeting, in, in, at the Barbados meeting that's scheduled in March, any remaining comments, hopefully few, will be um, resolved, and then that this will be sent for publication. And it should be published sometime early, mid next year. So. That's the mechanics. Now, maybe a lot of you just want to know this part. So we have. The, I mean, this is not really the focus of my part, but I just, you know, kind of want to give you an update of what's actually in it now. So we have about ten minutes. I want to run through some of that. So, real. I mean, SQL has been around. Somebody was asking me earlier. I think 1986 was the first version. So you know, it is a mature thing. We're not going to add like random new, grand features. Or at least that's less likely. Unless somebody comes up with a great idea, that's always good. But it is sort of it is what it is, right? So the the a lot of the work that has gone in lately is very smaller bits of improvements. I'll show some examples. JSON stuff, that's obviously a topic that's kind of of interest in databases, and a new part, SQL PGQ, which stands for property graph query. So we just talked about GQL, so there's two things going on in parallel there, right? There's Graph databases, okay, that's a whole topic and a whole separate thing. We don't need to go, can't go into that in too much detail, but there's two parallel projects going on. The GQL is an entirely separate database language that is, gonna, is not going to appear on Postgres, as far as I'm concerned, but it's going to be in other graph databases. They will presumably adopt that. If, you've, if you know, uh, if maybe you've heard of Cypher, that's the graph query language that people are using now. GQL is essentially meant to replace that. At the same time, PGQ is a, is a new sort of piece inside SQL where you can do some graph query. So it's a bit of a, kind of a subset of GQL that you can then use in SQL, okay? So here's an example of, of how that would look. And there are some implementations of this out there, not in Postgres. Uh, but that, this is how this could look. Uh, so you have a select query. This just starts. Let's see if we point this out here. You know, just a normal select query. But then you have a new from clause item graph table, and then inside of that you have some new stuff that looks. If you, again, if you've seen Cipher, this will look familiar. But this is a graph, a graph matching thing of some kind. Again, we don't have time to go into the details of this, but this is how it would, something you could do. And this would then look for a path in the graph and return value data out of that. So this is how that could look. When we publish the slides later, there's going to be a link to more detailed presentation of that. Okay. So this is, this is all about graph. I really don't have any more time. I, I'll happy to chat about this with people afterwards. This is the new JSON stuff in SQL 2023. Um, the first thing maybe is surprising to, to Postgres users, so there's a JSON type now in SQL. SQL 2016 had JSON functionality. Some of the stuff that's in Postgres, like JSON object, JSON array, those kind of clauses were in SQL 2016, but there was no type, JSON type. The reason for that was basically they ran out of time back then. That was before my time, but this is what has been told to me after. So they basically ran out of time. So you know that you do what you do sometimes in, in software engineering. You ship what you have, and then you do the next thing later, right? So there's a JSON type now in SQL. 
With that also goes things like, you know, you have to define the, the equality semantics and the ordering semantics of types that's defined in there now. There's some new, what's called item methods. So if you have used this SQL JSON path in Postgres, you might recognize some of that. There's these dot double and dot something functions. So there's a few more of those now. That's being worked on right now. A colleague of mine is working on that. There's a commit fest uh, entry for that. And it's, it looks fairly likely that that will be in Postgres 17. And the last thing uh, is this, what is called in the standard simplified accessor. So you can drill into a JSON column as if it were a, you know, sort of a, a row type, basically, or a complex type. So you can just say JSON dot something dot something dot something to drill into the JSON structure. In Postgres, you can do this essentially with the arrows and stuff like that. But this would be a, you know, this is sort of equivalent to how you would go into a, a composite type, basically. So I don't, I don't think anybody's working on that for Postgres right now, but you'd be welcome to if you wanted to. Okay, here's a, and then a couple of smaller bits, some of the, uh, just to kind of illustrate the kind of stuff that was going on. This unique null treatment clause, that's actually in Postgres 15. There's a, this kind of had an interesting history. So you, you guys know unique constraints and you know nulls, right? But there's always been a bit of a confusion about how those two should work together. If you have a unique constraint and a column is null, does, should that affect uniqueness or not? And you can debate the semantics, but if you looked at the standard, or the old version of the standard, like one part, it was kind of inconsistent. One part appeared to say this, and one, the other part appeared to say another thing. And different implementations did it differently. And so this was essentially resolved by making it an option. <laughs> so you can decide the way you want to treat nulls. And, mostly sort of for comp com compatibility, and then the implementation would define its default behavior. So Postgres had this uh, one behavior, but now uh, the, my understanding is um, Microsoft SQL Server, for example, has the other behavior. So if you want to migrate um, uh, applications now, you can pick the behavior in, in Postgres to make it compatible with that. So it's just you know one of those things that sometimes has to get fixed later. Another thing that's new, this is ancient in Postgres, but you can actually write var car without length now, just like that. So this is standard in Postgres, but it was not actually in the standard, but now it is. A couple of new functions were added. I mentioned the new, uh, the, uh, the any value. We implemented that in Postgres 16. The other ones mentioned up there were already in Postgres in other implementations. So in some cases, so the, the standardization basically said, oh, a lot of implementations are using this. We might as well put it in the standard. So many implementations already supported that. And this one is a bit dear to my heart because I worked on this. Um, you can, this is well known from various programming languages. You can write non-decimal li uh, numeric literals now in SQL and also have these like underscore separators in numbers. And this is also in Postgres 16. So. so this is kind of the summary of, quick summary of what's in SQL 2023. I wrote a couple blog posts on this. Uh, you can just go to my blog and kind of look through all of them or maybe you want to take a photo of this or look at the slides later where I give some more information on more details on, on, on some of these features. And in the last blog post, I kind of wrote the, a journey similar to what I'm describing today, but in sort of how I ended up actually doing this feature. So, okay. Everybody photographed that, great. So now, uh, what's next, right? Um, SQL 2023 was published just a few months ago, so there's really nothing happening right now. P people are working on finishing up GQL, as I indicated. In some way, the SQL working group is not, so the, the way it's composed is not too dissimilar to how, you know, how the Postgres community is composed. That people 
from different companies that each have their own sort of ideas and, and, and purposes working together on a common project, right? And so for that reason, there's also no common roadmap, right? Just like there's no roadmap for Postgres. There's, you know, some ideas and I have ideas, some of you have ideas, and at some point we work together and make some of them work. But the same thing is here. So there's no like, oh, when's the next version? What are we, what's, what's going to be in it? So I can speculate and talk to people. So one thing that's definitely going to ha happen uh, is definitely on the agenda is more work on graph stuff. That's kind of the hot thing right now, at least in that group. So there will be a new version of, or an enhanced version of PGQ very likely. There's, I gather more work on, on JSON in general on the agenda, JSON schema, for example. So it's kind of ironic, right? You first want to have unstructured data and you put a schema back on it, so okay. Streaming stuff I keep hearing about. So that would be the idea of not storing the data, but sort of have continuous, continuous flow of data and just keep sort of running aggregates, maybe something like that. So that's. I know people are working on that, but ultimately, you know, you c there's no restrictions. You can come in with whatever you want. I mean, if you have a huge project, you might have to work the politics a little bit and, and see what's sensible. But if you have small ideas, some of you have already sort of asked me earlier today or yesterday of you know your small ideas. That's definitely possible. We can do that. So it's up to us. All right. So here's a little bit of a jokey thing I wrote for myself. Again, I just indicated it's the, the culture in the group is kind of similar to the culture in, in, in you know, Postgres or open source. You know, you're sort of working with your competitors in a way on a common good, so it's kind of this interesting dynamic. And uh, for me, it was actually quite easy to get involved and in, in sort of adapt to the culture. And it's maybe different if you were sort of just used to working in, in traditional business, I guess. So. Yeah, so I kind of explained the, the progression to the release, um, the you know, and then the rest is sort of my jokey part. So the WG3 meetings are the commit fests, and uh, SC32 is sort of the yearly project status check-in, and the editors I indicated are sort of the people who are making actual committing. So it's you know kind of my memory aid here. <laughs> All right, so we're. Almost done. I do want to finish on time. Uh, you can reach me afterwards if you want to discuss, but we'll probably won't have time for extensive questions. But I just wanted to show you know, the, the project is a little bit bu more bureaucratic for the reasons I explained, but it's ultimately not too dissimilar to what we're doing. And it's, you know, the people out there are very like welcoming and interested, and they're also sort of database geeks and, and sort of laugh about things that nobody else would laugh about. And it's, it's, it's it's a quite fun experience. If this is your thing, it's not everybody's thing. But it, you know, so the point is, the other point I want to make is you saw the pictures, and the group is not too big. And you know, some of these people are about to retire. They've been threatening to retire for years now. And uh, so having a few more people in there wouldn't wouldn't hurt. Uh, we have a couple people from the Postgres community in there now. Ideally, I would also like to get some people from not Postgres because if we just end up with 20 Postgres people there, it's also not really the idea, right? But but the point, and you know, maybe catching up with what Simon was saying earlier, and I, what I was saying at the beginning, when I got involved in databases, right, the other big vendors were doing SQL, but we're the big vendor now, right? So I think we also have a responsibility in some sense, but it's also an opportunity to become, you know, sort of steering this process and, and becoming sort of the driving force of that. You know, Postgres is already the driving force of SQL de facto, but we can also be kind of in that in the ground floor. So if you're interested in that, uh, let me know. Or well, other than that, I just hope this kind of illustrated it to you a little bit. So that's all for me. Time's up. Thank you very much. <laughs>